Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. We have a treat for you listeners. Today we're talking about the supply and demand of surveillance technology across the world. We're talking about spheres of influence. We're talking about technospheres and how it all comes together. I am Valentin Weber. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student in cybersecurity and international relations at the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity, as well as at the Department of International Relations. I have recently submitted my thesis. Could you give us an elevator pitch about the work that you've been doing? My elevator pitch came from a real world problem, which is proliferation of um, surveillance technology, which we have seen taking off in the last couple of years. If you want to have specific examples, it's about uh, the increase of deployment of CCTV cameras with facial recognition. It's about journalists being targeted by spyware. So I really wanted to understand what what is driving the demand, but also what's uh, driving the supply. Suppliers of the surveillance technologies are China and Russia, Western countries such as Italy, uh, UK, US, who are also exporting that surveillance gear. But I was interested in, in the Chinese and Russian models of surveillance and information control, censorship, self-censorship, and comparing the two. Also, how those norms go from these two countries abroad, diffusion of technology, but also the norms that come ingrained in that gear. And so I was then interested in also what it means for the countries that are buying that technology, that surveillance technology, If they're strongly relying on either China or Russia, are they being drawn into technological spheres of influence? Are two countries still maintaining some kind of access to that technology afterwards? Have we seen any evidence? What are the ways that they would do it? What's their interest in maintaining that access? What's their interest in selling that technology? When you say that you're looking at the proliferation of surveillance technology, what do you mean by proliferation in this context? By proliferation, I mean that there were specific events in recent history where there was a coup d'etat, let's say in Egypt, right? And right after that, Egypt turned towards major supplier, which was China, and um, they engaged in a contractual relationship on uh, importing, whether that's about safe cities, which are geared towards maintaining public security, whether it's importing surveillance cameras or getting ideas from those countries. One Egyptian parliamentarian said they want their own Facebook to better control the information environment at home. So it's really about the proliferation is about that uh, almost a bilateral relationship between two countries, technology transfer, but also a transfer of ideas on how to do surveillance and censorship, self-censorship, and also training, right? Seen a lot of training coming along in how to access citizens' phones. For law enforcement officials, they would have specific gear on accessing your phone or your computer. Why has there been such a proliferation of that surveillance technology and of those trade relationships in the last couple of years? Are there specific events that you could point to? There were specific events. One of them is in Russia and China, first of all, promoting it to certain regions. All countries have their specific interests, whether that's trade, whether that's political interests, uh, security interests. China and Russia have identified the regions. China for the Dalton Road Initiative, which Egypt is part of of Silk Roads, the ancient Silk Roads, and they there's the idea of reviving that Silk Road and declaring those countries that are part of those two Silk Roads a strategic priority. And so I've seen that actually there's been a push coming from China uh, to export to those regions. For Russia, uh, mostly post-Soviet countries, where there's a quid pro quo, where Russia is supplying not only military equipment, right, more traditionally, but also in recent years, also technology to surveil the internet infrastructure that is then being deployed in telecommunications companies that run the internet domestically. I've looked at countries where I would have expected them to have a demand for that technology because they had a lot of protests. They had a a really uh, unstable political environment. Zimbabwe was interesting. I did interviews with government officials there to see why they bought the technology, what was their interest in, why specifically from China. So I got primary evidence of why that contract happens. Also fun part of the research to get so close to 
answering my question. So that, that was a, also a big part of my PhD. I did interviews also in, in, in Zimbabwe, Thailand, also in Zambia. So I got primary sources to understand specific periods in time. I looked at government officials in charge at the time. When we say primary sources, what are we talking about? What is a primary source? <laughs> sure, sure. Specifically to my project, uh, what I um, categorized as primary sources is those government official interviews. It was really difficult to get a hold of them. So I had to reach out to my network and try to snowball and start from one friend or colleague and go from there. And then I would, it would usually go from one country who, where another diaspora is located. Then you, it was really interesting to uncover those networks of people. So that was really difficult because a lot of these people are still very busy. Another one was network measurements of the internet infrastructure. With a colleague of mine, we tried to discover surveillance middle boxes, which are boxes that are deployed at various points in a country where a lot of data flows through. And these boxes are used to monitor content, also to filter out spam, to flow down your data because they've monitored your traffic and said, okay, you've used too much. At the same time, it's used for censorship. And so we covered Huawei middle boxes in different countries. We found them in, in several and within, with a current project uh, with the same colleague, we found even more of these boxes, thousands across the world, which are deployed by the UK, by, by over, I think, uh, 80 countries or so that we found. Of course, they're being deployed even more widely. That's also a primary source where we saw a specific box at a certain geographic location. Another one would be corporate documents, websites of Russian companies, where they would say, we sell to these countries and those countries. And that I would also take that as a primary source. You could argue that it's less reliable. But I think if the, if the company says that they're selling somewhere, that's how I measured or track the export of surveillance here. That's a primary source of their activities. The subversion of cybersecurity. Could you just explain a little bit what that means? It's really about understanding the subversion of cybersecurity because surveillance is about the subversion of cybersecurity. I wrote recently a um, blog post where I explained how if you want to do large-scale surveillance, you have to weaken systems, right? Whether that's um, you have to weaken end-to-end -end encryption, you have to weaken, uh, you have to um, weaken secure communication that happens between uh, a website and uh, your computer. And so I looked at Chinese government websites and found that they're really insecure. A lot of them don't uh, deploy HTTPS, even on the login portals or they, they use security practices that wouldn't be really up to standards. Why I thought this was the case is that they intentionally subverted cybersecurity in order to do surveillance, right? To surveil those websites. So that's what I mean by the subversion of cybersecurity. Even today, I mean, there's discussion within Europe, also within the US, of weakening end-to-end -end encryption in order to for various purposes, whether that is terrorism or what law enforcement would consider criminal behavior, that that would be another way of subverting cybersecurity. And that's really where my um, interest came in. It's a paradox where countries are intentionally moving into that direction and understanding how it happens, really looking into the details of how you'd build a backdoor in order to maintain uh, access to a certain equipment. Of course, you wouldn't design a backdoor and make it look like a backdoor. You want it to look like a bug. So there's all these insights. You can, you know, subvert cybersecurity in a very subtle way. How do countries deal with the challenge of using surveillance equipment or surveillance models that are imported from countries such as you mentioned China and Russia, which I think a lot of Western democracies might view as somewhat antagonistic? How do they deal with those concerns? Some of the surveillance concepts were actually brought to China. IBM was one of the major thinkers behind smart cities of digitizing the city and that was really that was really uh, welcomed in China and then they adopted that concept and developed it further so there has been a China and Russia they have learned also from western concepts of uh, law enforcement operations outside Europe and America it was the difficulty of actually putting those systems in place within China you have a government which has a strong capacity to, first of all, provide the equipment to buy it, then they have a lot of data on their citizens already gathered throughout the years, 
which they have just digitized, they have a really strong surveillance infrastructure in place. And if you come to a country like Zimbabwe, they would love to have such a system in place. But for them, it's really difficult to actually get the fingerprints of citizens to install facial recognition everywhere to actually make it to make it work and to keep it operational. If someone has an interest in actually keeping a, a keeping human rights alive, that's actually a good sign, right? That those countries are not able actually to copy paste it really easily in the new future. Maybe then that's going to be a cause of concern. So I'm, I'm very curious how the government officials that you spoke to grapple with that paradox between security and freedom in more democratic societies. Yes, so the government officials I spoke were often government officials that were very much in favor of freedom of expression, upholding privacy of citizens. They managed to, to be part of the government, be in opposition. And so for them, it was just interesting to explain what was happening. And even if they had a different, they were basically in favor of, of not pursuing uh, political dissidents, of not um, targeting um, populations, but they were really helpful at explaining how a government at a specific period of time decided to buy the technology and to go forward. So I didn't talk to any hardcore autocrats. The people who I talked to were really re- willing to share what was going on under the condition of anonymity. Traditionally, a sphere of influence would be defined by one country's influence over another country, which would mean at the same time the ex- exclusion of many other countries having influence in that country as well. During the Cold War, Eastern Europe being a sphere of influence of Russia or of the Soviet Union, and the Americas being a sphere of influence of the US during the Cold War. And both countries would know, okay, we're not going to mess or interfere within those spheres of influence because we, we recognize it. These today, in a technological sphere of influence, it's really difficult to say you can exclude anyone from that sphere of influence. If you're now, let's say, China, and you export lots of technology to Egypt, and you can subvert that technology, it means that you have a privileged capability to access that technology, but it doesn't prevent other countries from, um, from access. At the same time, I think it... It means that a strong influence on a country's governance um, of technology, how they perceive technology, if they can strongly direct or shape the ideas within the country. For the U.S., within the countries of the Freedom Online Coalition, so the U.S. has had a very strong influence on how those countries perceive technology. You um, have that uh, vision of the internet, and that's also a kind of influence where you shape the norms to control technology, and that's um, technological uh, spheres of influence, technospheres for short. Take us through technospheres. Technospheres is a term that I coined. What I observed is that, to give an example, is that China has a, uh, supplies a lot of technology to um, Zimbabwe, Egypt, Thailand, to these countries, and that means that it can build in backdoors more easily, right, if it wants to. That means that it has a privileged capability to control technology within these countries. At the same time, it really has a strong influence on how those countries perceive technology and how they use it, which means that um, Egypt will say, right, we love what China is doing um, So, in terms of surveillance and censorship, and they will say, we'll do uh, in a similar way. And that's what a technosphere is. We can see those technospheres now emerging within the world and those technospheres usually entail a major hegemon such as whether it's russia china the us but also the eu right through their um, ability to shape privacy regulations across the world through gdpr so in all these layers and ways and different countries um, technospheres emerging smaller countries especially will be drawn into different spheres of influence where they will be pushed by major countries to use sites a technosphere is a privileged capability by your major hegemon to access technology uh, or control technology within another country. And it's also the ability of that hegemon to influence the governance of um, technology within another country. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just don't know what a hegemon is, and I'm really curious. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a hegemon is a very powerful country that has a strong a lot of influence over smaller countries, which are usually referred to as vassal countries. 
right? There is a strong hierarchical nature between two countries where a hegemon can direct or influence uh, what's happening in a less powerful country. Examples are the US, China, Russia, regional hegemons are Iran, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so what's next for you? I was always drawn towards think tanks because they provide you with a nice mixture between being able to do research and also organizing events and being plugged into the policy world. So I'll be soon joining a think tank uh, in Berlin. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. That's next for me. And where can people find you on the interwebs? I do have a website, balancingweber.com. I'm also on Twitter. You can find me under the handle WeberV underscore, uh, also on LinkedIn. The last question which we ask all of our guests is, what is cybersecurity to you, Valentin? It's probably 80% of my day. You know, it's, of course, it's work. It's my friends. It's many things. And it's just been part of the last five years of my life, <laughs> basically, starting uh, with the PhD, um, entering the Center for Doctoral Training. Cybersecurity has so many categories that you can't be an expert in even two of them, app security or supply chain security, hardware security. We continuously start understanding what it isn't. We're all plugged into, into cyberspace. Everything's connected. So it's a term is evolving every day. I feel I can't give you a really good definition of it. The absence of surveillance, perhaps. That was our interview with Valentin. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.